Bringing students. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Ash. Okay. So today I would like to begin with the, the new unit that is 9.6 because in the last uh, part we finished talking about 9.1. But before moving to 9.6, there is a common topic that we notice uh, between a couple of these units. Okay, either 9.1, we talked about DNA technology and recombinant DNA uh, technologies, right? As part of that, as well as I was briefly mentioning to you in the 9.4 part, where uh, we had uh, human DNA profiling, DNA profiling that we have. And uh, also in the unit 12, we have one topic that I have not discussed with you uh, in either 9.4 or 9.1. So that is DNA fingerprinting. I'm going to briefly talk to you first on DNA fingerprinting and what is the use of DNA fingerprinting uh, and you general uh, use of it and plus anthropological applications of DNA fingerprinting. We are going to focus on that. So, and then we'll begin with the 9.6 part markers. Okay. So, right. Uh, so, what is DNA fingerprinting and uh, how, how is that uh, done? Because it's a method again. So, either you see it as 9.1 or you see it as 9.4. So, it has a role in detecting genetic diseases as well as it also has a role in forensic analysis. So, even in the unit 12 part, forensic anthropology, if you see, DNA fingerprinting can be mentioned as an application of that. Okay. Right. So, what is DNA fingerprinting and how does it work? Let me briefly explain you that. Okay. I'm not sure if you recognize uh, this person on the right here uh, who has contributed greatly to the DNA fingerprinting and development in India. Okay. And also we can refer it to as human DNA profiling. So make a note of it, either in 9.4, it directly says human DNA profiling in 9.4. And uh, as part of 9.1 also, it is one of the method that we use to you know, detect few uh, aspects of humans. It could be evolution, origin of humans. So it can be seen as a method to study humans as well. Okay, right. The person who is on the right here in this uh, presentation, this slide uh, is Dr. Lalji Singh. Dr. Lalji Singh. Okay, not sure if you heard about his name. So, Dr. Lalji Singh, his name is Dr. Lalji Singh. Okay, so he's, he's known as father of DNA fingerprinting. Father of, you know, DNA print, fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting in India. Of course, he's not the one to discover this. I'm sorry to invent this. But he's the one to actually develop the required technologies and understanding in India. So India, basically for development of this in India, he was a former director of CCMB. So Hyderabad-based Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology was a former director. And uh, so as part of it that we are going to talk about in the principle as well as in the method, there are a few components like probes required for understanding the pattern of our DNA, our genome 
was given by Dr. Lal J. Singh. So he has a great, great contribution. I think even even received Padma Vibhushan for that. And uh, even several criminal course, uh, cases which were solved using DNA fingerprinting, Dr. Lal J. Singh had to go to courts and explain the judges the importance of uh, DNA fingerprinting uh, in using as an evidence in solving crimes. So because it's like a technological uh, you know, hurdle for many people, because I don't think we can expect uh, you know, judges, for example, or even many investigators to understand the importance of DNA fingerprint. So a pioneer like him had to walk to courts, especially in the Rajiv Gandhi's assassination case. We're going to talk about a case study today, Tandoor case it is called, even in Tandoor's case. So Dr. Lalji Singh was key in explaining the importance of DNA fingerprint. So he made DNA fingerprinting technically possible in India. And also he made it you know, uh, for utilization of this in solving crimes in India. So hence he's called as father of DNA fingerprinting in India. Okay, Although the invention of DNA fingerprinting was done by another scientist called Alec Jeffries. Alec uh, Jeffries. Like Jeffries, yes, well, that's like Jeffries, the England scientist, UK based scientist, like Jeffries. He's a main inventor of this, but in India, something specific to the technology had to be done and had to bring it to the real applications in uh, judiciary systems. So, this credit goes to Dr. Lalji Singh, who passed away at the end of 2017. Okay, briefly wanted to mention about uh, some of these and uh, also is important because he created what is called a genome foundation in India. Because we were talking about importance of genomics, right? How genomics is important in diagnosing problems, coming up with better treatments. So what he had done, uh, he created genome foundation and the genome foundation focused mostly on vulnerable groups, especially people from the rural areas that where he started collecting data and information and uh, bringing awareness in them related to genetic problems. So he definitely contributed greatly to the this part, physical anthropology part of the uh, component as a molecular biologist. Okay, so just wanted to make a mention about him because I don't think you will get questions on this like uh, in the exam, but I wanted to be aware about a personality who contributed to this and made it possible to have such a technology uh, in, in India. Okay, right. So let me next answer, what is DNA profiling or what is DNA fingerprinting? And why is it called a fingerprinting? Any idea what is the connection to DNA fingerprinting and fingerprints, are they same? Is there any connection there? It's really unique. It is unique, which is unique? Fingerprints or DNA? Both. Both. Okay, the next question is, uh, is our DNA as unique as fingerprints? Probably not because maybe twins have same. Okay, leaving out twins. No, mostly unique. The okay. 0.1%, 0 0.001%. It is actually, uh, fingerprint seems to be unique in all of us, even in twins. But DNA is not. DNA has certain regions which can definitely vary. So we are banking on that, that region of the DNA, 0.1% of the DNA that we are banking on. Okay, so definitely fingerprints are unique. There's no doubt about that. Very, very, very rare cases where people may share same fingerprints. But DNA, of course, we all do share DNA to certain extent. So it is not as great as fingerprints, but it has other advantages of using it. So in a way, we can say it is like fingerprints, DNA fingerprinting. So like fingerprints, our DNA information can also be used in identify a person as so-and-so. We can also identify a person as so-and-so. We can also do that, right? In that sense, it is like fingerprints. It is DNA fingerprint, an identical or a pattern of DNA that we can use as fingerprints. So. Here it is not referring to DNA being collected from fingerprints. DNA can be collected from fingerprints, but they're not referring for this, to the source here. They are instead, like fingerprints, we are using DNA as a unique source to identify a person as such. Okay. Right. 
I see Preeti, or uh, you have joined the class for the first time. Now, uh, if you have any questions uh, as you are, you know, following the lecture, you can feel free to ask me those questions. Okay, and if you are okay, sir. So, and also we 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 prefer students to actually have their, uh, you know, videos open so we can have an interaction and see if that is possible for you. Consider actually uh, having your uh, webcam open. Right? Okay. So, so that we can directly interact and feel like an offline class. Okay, right. So did you uh, already uh, attended or seen few uh, last classes? Yes, I uh, seen all the uh, other lectures. Oh, great. Very good. Very good. Okay. So are you comfortable with the content and information so far? Yes, sir. So feel free to ask me questions in between if you are unsure. And also participate when I'm asking questions. It's all right. If you don't know the answers, it's all right. Even if you can guess, you can participate. Okay. Okay, sir. Right. So human DNA profiling or DNA fingerprinting we're talking about here. I briefly told about Lalji Singh, Dr. Lalji Singh, who is a great contributor to this. And also I'm talking to you the difference between fingerprints and the normal fingerprints and the DNA. Definitely fingerprints are more unique, but DNA, we have a lot of flexibility because fingerprints, imagine if someone erases the fingerprint, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to actually capture what we are looking for. And it is confusing. And we cannot simply rely on only fingerprints for collecting data, especially in solving crimes. So instead, uh, we want to have something that has more flexibility and more information in it. And DNA definitely a great candidate for that. How we are going to see that and how does it work? Let me first explain you the principle briefly about it. So we already talked about this as part of unit 9.4, correct? So where we discussed that uh, we have 99.9 .9 or 99.99% similarity, depending on what source we are talking about. So if it is 99.9% .9 similarity, we have about 0.1% difference, correct? And if you have considering 99.99% uh, similarities, then at least we have 0.01% differences among humans. We are comparing whom here? We are comparing human DNA. Okay, so we have at least 0.01% to 1% differences. That still accounts for enough differences, right? I think I was telling you this in the 9.4 part. So anywhere between 3 lakhs to 30 lakhs of nucleotides may be different between two individuals. So range, we're talking about 0.3. So approximately 3 lakhs differences are 3 million. So basically 30 lakhs differences may be there. That is enough differences. So we are, we are in our focus is on those differences. Our focus is not on those similarities that we have. We have enough differences that can be picked up by techniques. So we can differentiate. Mainly we can actually identify a person as so and so. You will see it here in DNA fingerprinting and in applications. So you want to establish, let's say you are solving a crime you found a DNA sample in the crime scene. You actually want to check if that sample matches with any of the suspect's DNA. So your goal is to find a match. And if you find a match, okay, then you know that so-and-so person was there in the crime scene. So our goal is to find and identify that DNA, whether it matches to the persons you are, who you are suspected. So it can become an evidence in the process. Okay, so you have this idea in your mind, even when I'm talking to you about the method, I'm going to involve you uh, to see what you can answer there and so that you can actually understand the procedure and the process of DNA fingerprinting is done. Okay, now let's understand more about the principle. So, so far I told you that we have about 0.1 to 0.1% difference approximately that we are focusing on knowing those differences. Out of 3 billion letters that I was talking to you, Okay, this information is a slide or image we already discussed as part of the uh, Human Genome Project. So I'm not going to repeat that, but I'm going to focus on more on explaining the principle behind it. Okay, so within this 0.1% differences that we are talking about in our DNA, We have 0.1% approximately. 
So within those, there are few regions where there is higher amount of variation because we are not even interested in knowing all three lakhs letters or thirty lakhs letters. That is too much to look for for simply identifying a person's identity. Right? Instead, we want to focus on the regions where there is higher region with you know high amount of variation. Region with high amount of variation. high amount of variation. Okay, what are those regions? So scientists found out that within our chromosome, we have some repeat sequences. we have some repeat sequences so meaning same sequence repeats multiple times so repeat sequences there yeah. okay they come in varieties of sizes they come in variety of sizes what are those varieties some of them are called micro satellites some of them are called some of these repeat sequences are known as micro satellites where the length of them is about 1 to 9 base pairs one one repeat basically one sequence like that which is repeating maybe 1 to 9 base pairs and they are called micro bigger than micro or mini and bigger than mini or macro so mini satellites are about 10 to 100 base pairs they are below 100 but above micro satellite range so micro satellites are 1 to 9 base pairs and the mini satellites are 10 to 100 and macro satellites are above Okay, so what are we talking about here? Size of the the repeating sequence. To explain you, I would like to take an example. But instead of nine letters or ten letters, I'm actually taking only four letters to keep it easy for you. To keep it easy for you, I'm just picking up this G A T C for example. So G A T C. If this is a sequence, so this is four letters, right? So is it micro satellite or mini satellite? If it has four letters, is it micro or mini? Micro. <laughs> Correct. Micro satellite, right? So micro satellite can be like this. And what are we learning? These are tandem repeats. Remember what we discussed in CRISPR Cas9 system. In CRISPR, they were palindromic repeats, so they read the same in both the directions. And here they are tandem repeats. What does that mean by tandem repeat? Do you see the word here? Tandem. T R S or tandem repeats. They are known as. It is at the bottom of the slide here. So what are tandem repeats? Tandem means like this. So two such sequences are present next to each other. I'm just coloring them to keep it bit easier. So repeating sequence like that: G A T C, G A T C, G A T C, like that. So these are called a tandem repeats. These are called tandem repeats. So, how do the tandem repeats vary then? We are talking about the presence of a sequence called, you know, micro satellite here. A G A T C, a G A T C, G A T C is present, like the mini G A T C. So, repeats of the sequence. So, tandem repeats. Repeats found in tandem or next to each other. So, how do they vary? There may be two different ways. Two ways in which they may be differ between people. Let's pick up. You are not. You are looking into a person A and a person B. We are talking about a person A and a person B. So, person A, let's say, has G A T C sequence. Has G A T C sequence. So, one way is he has the sequence. Okay, he has the sequence. Person A has the sequence. Whereas, person B didn't have the sequence. Person B didn't have the sequence. Okay, that can be one one form of difference, either having the sequence or not having it. So we can differentiate two individuals for particular location for particular sequence. If you don't find G A T C G A T C repeat in one person, so okay, he is different from person who shows G A T C G A T C sequence. So one simple way of understanding this is not having a sequence in one person but in the other person. 
Second possibility here is having same sequence. Both A and B has same sequence, but the number of times a sequence repeats is different. Like person A, the sequence repeats for hundred times. It repeats for how many times? Hundred times. Person B. It repeats for let's say thousand times. Is it enough difference to identify it, based on any of our discussions from the previous classes in methods? Can you tell me if you can differentiate a DNA fragment of hundred, hundred nucleotides? Because when we say this GATC repeated hundred times, what is the size of that fragment? Let's say you're only looking into the DNA fragment. The sequence is of four letters and it repeated hundred times. What is the length of that DNA fragment? Four hundred base pairs. Exactly, four hundred base pairs. Very good. Four hundred base pairs. But the same thing in person B. How big will that sequence be? Four thousand. Correct. Four thousand base pairs. Right? Because it's four letters word repeated thousand times. So four into thousand, four thousand base pairs. Four letters. So another four letters will be eight. Another four letters will be twelve, like that. So sequence with four letters has repeated hundred times. So four into hundred is four hundred base pairs, and four into thousand is four thousand base pairs. The length of the fragment containing this sequence will have four hundred. If it hundred times repeats, and if it is thousand times repeated, four thousand base pairs. So can we differentiate size of two fragments? Is it possible to pick that difference? Let's say because the two scenarios I'm telling you here, one scenario where you are looking for presence and absence of certain sequence. If that is not there, and it is there, you can categorize people onto two of these categories. Or second, we're talking about that sequence is there. Two people A and B share the sequence, but they have difference in the number of repeats. And there is a term to this. This is called variable number tandem. Repeats. It is called variable number tandem repeats or VNTRs. It is called. VNTRs or variable number tandem repeats. So, did you understand the meaning of it? Variable number tandem repeats. Tandem repeats are there, but there the number of repeats are different. That is what I've explained you here between A and B. And if you know variable number tandem repeats in the principle, if you are writing about this technique, mention about it. Mention that. So, in the I'm repeating so far what I've explained to you. See if you missed anything here. So, how do you use DNA fingerprinting? DNA fingerprinting focuses on few regions. Which are more variable among human populations, are variable among a given population that is under study. Like Indian population, maybe we have variation in certain regions, which may not be same with American populations or European populations. So, like that, we are focusing on the regions where there is more variation. What are those regions where is more variation in human DNA? We have variation in. Certain regions called micro satellite region, mini satellite regions, and macro satellite regions. Regions are where repeat sequences are found. Meaning, we have sequence a length of one to nine, or ten to hundred, or above, which tends to repeat. Such sequences are repeat sequences, tandem repeat sequences. So, how do you know the difference with uh, based on this tandem repeat sequences? The two pos, at least two possibilities. One possibility here. That the two given people are may or may not have the same sequence, or even if they have the same sequence, but the number of times that sequence repeats may vary. So based on this difference, this has been observed by analysis by various scientists. Based on this difference, we are going to perform DNA fingerprint. Is this principle clear to you? How this is used? How do you identify it? I'm going to tell you next, but. Is the principle sounding all right to you? Are you able to follow it? If not, any questions? Anything that you, anything that bothered you? 
anything that you could not understand. Sir, uh, is it possible uh, that we have variable number at hmm. different locations? Uh, hmm. Instead of one location where we are finding, instead hmm. of uh, 100, we have 1000 at some other location. Correct. That way we will miss up. Yes, it, 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 may, it may be possible. But the thing is, if it is present in a different regions, so you will notice that the way we test this, we actually cut the DNA into pieces. If it is present in some other region, it will show up as a different fragment of the different length. That is also all. Okay, if this is possible. And normally, what do they do? Scientists actually design. They design what are called probes to identify these regions. And normally, they have to analyze them in a given population. So they should have an idea if this happens to be present in different regions. Then result can be seen. They can see that same probe is binding to different fragments with different lengths. That will tell them that these people also have this sequence somewhere else. So that can be identified, that can be used. Okay. But technically, they can figure it out. If you really understand what I've explained to you, technically, they can figure it out because they can see another fragment carrying the or binding to the same probe sequence. Okay. So, yes, it is very much possible to have it something like that. If it is there, then they can identify using the experiment that they are performing. Okay. okay. So next. So how is this done? How do you identify those regions? Let's let's ask that question. So how is it performed? What is the method behind DNA fingerprinting? Okay. So I already explained as part of the principle. Can we identify these difference in the size? If A as hundred time repeats, B as thousand time repeats, can we know? Uh, how that looks differently? Can we differentiate both A and B? If so, how? How do how we do it? So, what is the method behind in a fingerprinting? Right. So, assuming that you actually are uh, solving a crime, let's say, you, you do you watch uh, programs like CADs and those things, okay, or any other programs doesn't matter, where they they do show some sort of uh, investigations like this. Imagine that you are such an investigator, you are an expert uh, expert in DNA fingerprinting. Okay, so I just want you to connect to this process because it's very logical if you see and you have to add a little bit of knowledge that we gained from understanding from the RDNA technology, recombinant DNA. So in combination, you should be able to understand this. So the first of all, let's say you went to crime scene. There was a murder that happened, you went to crime scene. Okay, so what do you look for? And you are a DNA fingerprinting expert. So what is your aim when you go to such a crime scene? Look for any uh, human material, your blood. Very good. Look for any material that carries human DNA. So DNA containing samples that you would look for. Any examples of sequences, uh, Sunil, or the Asha, or Preeti. So any examples of sequences that contain DNA that we can find in the crime scene normally? Any one of you, doesn't matter. We can find uh, hairs. If, uh, hair sample, okay, good. Hair uh, sample, fingerprints hair also can be found. Okay, what else? Nails, nails, nails. right? Hair, nail, Shweta. So shoe. Shoe, okay. Uh, possible, but what aspect of shoe are you thinking of? Like shoe print. Shoe print. No, we're talking about samples for DNA. We are not looking for any other clues because you are DNA experts. There will be other experts, forensic experts who look for other uh, potential sources. But we want something that contains DNA. My question is, what tissues contain DNA which can be found in crime scene? The material used to kill the person. Okay, like? Like knife. We could have a fingerprint of the killer on that. Right. But we are talking about, we are talking about DNA fingerprint. Hmm. But indeed, actually, you are to a certain extent you are right because fingerprints can also be used because fingerprints also leave some skin cells. Even if you carefully pick up that, those skin cells can be taken. Okay, but otherwise, we are looking for any tissue of the humans, like hair tissue, skin tissue, blood tissues. Okay, and also there's so many possible. Yes. yes. 
Sweet. What is it? Sweet saliva. Saliva, very good. So it could be teeth, saliva. So, and sometimes, you know, within the nails, people may have, if it is a kind of, there was any sort of, uh, you know, arguments that have happened or a physical exchange that happened there, you might see, you know, scratching, body scratches, and especially that got into the uh, nails of the victim. Okay. So if it is, uh, you know, a rape case, semen can be collected. Otherwise, urine, fingernails, muscle tissues, cigarette butts, even cigarette butts. Because cigarette butts, normally they can leave some cells. So we are looking for those cells that are attached to the cigarette butts. Like that, many of them. Okay, but this is all right for us. This is enough. So fingerprints also can be used. Dandruff can be used. So like these type of components can be used. So, so many possibilities are there. But one thing that we have to remember, usually, do, we, do you think we get enough sample there? Enough tissue you will find usually? You will find hundreds of hairs. You will find a lot of skin. Several grams of skin, if not kgs of skin. No, you won't, right? Unless people you know, actually want to trap someone in the crime, they may actually, you know, scratch their body, correct? Or pull their hair, they can do it. But otherwise, normally we don't receive, we don't get enough sample there. Don't have to write all these samples, just wanted to give you an idea. Most importantly, blood, hair, semen, saliva. If you write, these are sufficient, but be familiar that something like cigarette butts, something like fingerprints also can contain some amount of tissue from which we can collect the end. Well, do they also uh, take uh, this thing? The cells that we generate every hour, I mean, they fall off from our body. So dead cells, do they also consider those cells? Yes. Dead cells also will contain nucleus and DNA will be there. Doesn't matter if dead or alive, DNA will be present in those cells. Okay, depending on the time period and other stuff. But yes, DNA is a very stable molecule. It may stay in it unless in the dead cell, if the the destruction of the cell components happen, then it's a problem. Okay, so it depends on the stages. Couple of things do matter, but usually DNA can be found in majority of. Sir, once the cell dies, so the DNA material and cytoplasm and everything components remain intact. Normally, they get recycled. So what happens um, in in uh, if you see the fossil information, bones, there are few tissues where they can be body cells. Within them, DNA remains forever, or at least as far as our knowledge goes, for several lakhs of kilo uh, years, it can stay intact. But some damages can happen. DNA can be broken down. Otherwise, it is considered to be very, very stable molecule. That is why DNA being used as a very good evidence against many things, including our uh, evolutionary studies. Ancestral human DNA can be obtained even today. Dinosaur DNA can be obtained today. So it is so stable that it can stay, survive throughout the you know uh, millions of years. Okay. So next, what do you do? So you collected, you found the DNA sample. Let's say you got enough uh, hair sample or skin sample. So you take that sample to the laboratory. And then what do you do in the laboratory? So in the laboratory, so you collect, let's say, blood sample or skin sample you got, you extract DNA from it. So here, this slide shows you steps in it. You want to write like a flow chart. And where possible, write down a few key points. So on the left or right hand side, you write a flow chart and write few points on the side. So sample you got, tissue containing DNA you got and you extract DNA or isolate DNA from it. So you isolate DNA from it, I extract DNA from it. Then the DNA is fragmented into pieces. So DNA is huge. It's a long threads of DNA. It won't be easy for you to look for the sequences that you are interested in. The sequences where the differences exist or variations exist, I was telling you. So to identify them easily, you actually chop DNA into fragments or into pieces. So what are those tools that we learned in the uh, last class or a class before that in the recombinant DNA technology? How are those tools called? which help in cutting DNA? Molecular scissors. Molecular scissors or restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes. Okay, molecular scissors in general we call them or restriction enzymes. 
so those enzymes if you add those enzymes to the dna then what happens dna will be fragmented so several sizes of the dna fragment will be released a dna broken down into several fragments with varied sizes Okay, so then we receive the fragments of DNA, but they they usually they are in different lengths. Did you learn about a method where we can separate the DNA based on size? Did I talk to you about electrophoresis? Yes, sir. Right. So, what is the principle in of DNA electrophoresis? So we talked about so separation it. based on charge. So separation based on size and charge size correct excuse me size then size and charge right so dna has negative charge so negatively charged dna will be attracted to the positively charged electrode so what do you do you actually take a container with electrodes in it okay and uh, towards the negative electrode you place the dna sample that you want to analyze and uh, you push it to the positive electrode through electricity in the influence of electricity so dna will be attracted to the positive electrode but i was telling you based on the size when dna moves from one side to another side based on the size the dna gets separated the shorter fragments of dna move faster in this material like a gel like material so it moves faster towards the electrode and whereas the larger fragments bigger fragments move slower like that separation happens based on the size so i think i was also telling you briefly numbers here like 50 100 200 300 400 500 like that nucleotides from bottom so the top one is the starting point they are going away to this electrode so they get separated based on the size correct so we separated all these new fragments based on their size this is to make it easy for us to look for the region where or identify the region where that fragment is that sequence is so then we can compare between two people is a fragment found at the same size okay so like that you took the dna sample and uh, restricted it or cut it into fragments and these cut fragments are separated based on their size using electrophoresis technique okay i think we also talked about this in western blot same concept we discussed in western blot but there in western blot we were talking about proteins identifying antigens or proteins in uh, immunogenetics part we talked about right western blotting i talked about here we talk about southern blotting there it was western blotting here it is southern blotting the difference here there we were detecting protein here you are detecting dna that is a difference that's why they got different names both are blotting techniques both require transferring fragments in this case dna fragments from this gel to a membrane so you take a membrane you take this electrophoresis uh, gel so what do you do you actually put it together like this and you apply current and what happens these fragments will switch to the or will move to the membrane okay and there you blot it blotting in the sense you dry it you fix it okay southern blotting deals with dna material western blotting deals with the protein material okay so now it moved on to this membrane so after electrophoresis what we did we did southern blotting what happens in southern blotting in southern blotting this dna fragments are transferred from a gel to a membrane because it is easy to detect the sequences on the membrane than the gel gel is not suitable for that so it is switched to the membrane okay then how do you identify are you interested in knowing all the sequences that are part of this dna which sequences should we look for 
uh, where the uh, variation is more. Correct. Where there is more variation. So how do you see? How do you identify that vari variable age? So scientists might have already, as I was mentioning to you, might have already figured that out. Might have already know which sequences are those. Let's say GATC, GATC example we took, right? So let's say you want to identify GATC sequence and the length of the DNA fragment that carries it. In so basically, what do you do? You collected the DNA sample from the crime scene, right? Similarly, what do you do? You also collect DNA from the suspects. So same time, what do you do? You run the or you analyze the sample that the DNA sample you got from the crime scene and the DNA sample you collected from the suspects. Assuming that we have two suspects, A and B, you are running their DNA simultaneously. So there'll be not one line like this. You'll have three lines. One with the reference sample found at the crime scene and one A sample here, B sample here. Like that. So you are interested in only identifying where the DNA fragments are with the variation. So for that, you use probe. We use probe. What is a probe? Do you remember what does it mean by a probe? Probe is a? Set of nucleotides, okay. Any set of nucleotides? Set of nucleotides complementary to the sequence that you are looking for. Set of nucleotides complementary. So probe is a complementary sequence to the target sequence. Probe is the complementary sequence to the target sequence. So what is the target sequence here? In our example that we took. So probe is a complementary sequence to the target sequence. And what is the target sequence here in the example I gave you? Now, did you remember that sequence? The sequence I wrote here, can you see from that? GATC. GATC sequence. So, what is the complementary sequence to GATC? GATC? CTAG. CTAGCT. C T A G C T A G C T A G C T A G C T A G correct. So what do you do? You actually take a probe like that, which would bind to the sequence that you are looking for. Or the sequence where this there is maximum variation in Indian population, for example. Such a such a probe can be created. And uh, Dr. Lalji Singh was a pioneer in this. He created probes for detecting differences among human DNA samples. So he was one person who contributed to this greatly where uh, the probes were created suitable for India. So you England scientists might have identified it, but we cannot pick up their probes for utilization in DNA analysis of Indians. So we had to identify, we had to perform studies on human DNA, human genomic sequences and look for those sequences in us. That is what Dr. Lalji Singh had done as part of his research. And he found out that, uh, that we could create probes suitable for Indian Indians. Okay. Right. So, but... Yes. Does that mean that we uh, Indians have similar uh, DNA? Yes, of course. We, we Indians share more DNA compared to the uh, Europeans, for example. Our DNA will be will will match more than the Europeans' DNA when we compare an Indian's DNA with the European DNA. So across India, it will be similar. There will be variation. Like we'll be more similar to each other. If you go to northeastern part of India, there will be more differences. Like that, depending on how related are we to each other. Okay, so we probably are generated from the same ancestors in a way who migrated to India at one point of time. But maybe mixture of DNA had, uh, had been mixed, which is called intermixing might have happened between races over a period of time. But those people who live in a given region may share more DNA than the people who live. Like Nadisan people are more diverse. They have more DNA elements like Mongolite elements are more common in them than our Asian elements, right? So it depends on who you are comparing, but usually we will share more DNA than the uh, us sharing DNA with the Europeans or uh, Americans, for example. Okay, we are more similar, basically. So, simplistic thing is we are more similar in terms of our DNA to each other. Okay, right. So, we are looking for those probes. But the probe only binds to the, if probe only binds to the sequence, can we see where that probe bound? Will there be any signal? If another DNA sequence went there and bound, what is the difference? Would that tell its location, its presence? Same way as what they use in RT-PCR. For COVID-19, they are using RT-PCR. 
rt pcr probes are connected to some fluorescent probes or some fluorescent tags in olden days we used to use radioactive probes so meaning to the this complementary sequence they attach the radioactive element maybe phosphorus maybe carbon they attach a radioactive element or instead of radioactive element you can attach a fluorescent fluorescent probe meaning fluorescent means something that glows so wherever this dna sequence is you will see a signal coming you see glow in that region so you will identify its location excuse me so you can identify its location do you understand so probe contains two things here one is a complementarity to the target sequence plus in addition to that sequence something attached to it which can give signal something that can attach to like radioactive element like radioactive isotopes like a phosphorus for example or any radioactive isotope for the matter tritium for example radioactive elements are attached to it or fluorescent molecules so molecules which glow so like that fluorescent probe will bind to the target region and will tell us and will tell us where the sequences are maybe one fragment two fragments multiple fragments depending on how many sites it is there or even if this restriction enzyme cut in between for example you can identify it is in the two fragments but definitely the size based information can be obtained here size based information can be obtained so now let's see what pattern i'm going to show you another image where if you did something like this see if there is a map a pattern that is similar between the sample you received from the crime scene and the suspects sample received from the crime scene and the suspect okay so uh, i have an image to show you on this component that how dna probes work here So I was telling you here, like GT GATC sequence we talked about, but similarly GT GT AAT, a complementary sequence that they have taken here. Okay, if this is a sequence, it will go and bind here. The sequence will bind in particular region, but and the fluorescent attached to that either radioactivity. So site at which the probe binds can be identified by the radioactivity or the fluorescence that the probe gives. so let me see what will be the result of this process okay what what will you see here so let me quickly pause it and bring another image here <coughs> excuse me look at this slide okay so let's say on the left hand side you found the sample in the crime scene and two suspects if you want to consider two or three doesn't matter here so let's say you found three suspects here so see who does this sample look like whose dna is it matching is suspect 1 2 or 3 is their dna matching with the dna sample from the crime scene whose dna showing same pattern as the dna that you found in the crime scene suspect 2 suspect 2 correct okay. need it is highlighted here suspect 2 two. two fragments on top one fragment here one fragment here two fragments here and definitely suspect 1's dna is different suspect 3's dna is different this is what you can obtain because you didn't know initially you probably suspected three people but you didn't know who are there but courts require evidence for this and you found an evidence now you said in the crime scene obtained so and so sample this dna matched with the suspect 2's dna so suspect 2 was present in the crime scene sometimes you cannot prove that he committed the crime maybe in case of a murder or in case of rapes maybe semen sample can prove it but usually if that is present there it just shows that 
suspect was there in the crime scene and you have an evidence for that okay so what do you do you look for the same pattern if pattern is matched you know that dna belongs to that person that the dna you found in the crime scene belongs to that person the way it is seen here so it is this clear in the actual uh, case that we have or is it just a kind of presentation just a kind of a presentation the actual picture will be more complex than this you will find because one one thing i would like to ask you that may help you understand the real picture here so let's assume that we are only looking for we are only using one probe looking for one target sequence how likely that the sequence won't be present just accidentally in other person i'm repeating my question let's say you're looking for only gatc 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 what is the chance that someone else is not just matching randomly he was not present he was not there but that particular probe is pre also that particular sequence is present in him as well is it possible or not statistically finding someone with the same sequence in a population like what we have in india it is possible so you cannot go with one sequence you know uh, what is the solution to this you want to rule out all the random possibilities of matching you want to rule out the random possibilities of matching what needs to be done multiple exactly multiple sequences need to be found so in real picture maybe more much more complicated this is just to explain it there's an image i found online just to explain the process the real picture will have multiple fragments and a normal manual observation is not enough they use some softwares to identify this way computer programs are used for identifying how much matching between crime scene sample suspect 2 suspect 1 suspect 3 maybe sometimes 10 suspects you have 10 suspect sample so what did happen in a family where 10 people lives you know what do you do to take collect their all samples oh you are suspect But sometimes maybe more samples in this and more fragments because you cannot just come to a conclusion because one sequence is different or one sequence is overlapping you cannot go with it as per the indian government you know guidelines 13 probes we have to look for 13 such sequences one three 13 probes we normally use 13 sequences we look for so statistically they say that if you can check for 13 sequences in no random case you will have same dna in the other person so you can assure you can assure that the sequence if it is matched it is matched without you know any random error or random chance so the real picture will be complicated than this so we can definitely use dna fingerprinting as an evidence for solving crimes any well known cases for this i think i was telling you rajiv gandhi assassination case rajiv gandhi was killed by a human bomb belonging to ltt correct so but the person actually killed rajiv gandhi how did they come to know that so and so person killed rajiv gandhi and where did they get the reference sample from because this person also also died in the incident because it's a human bomb how did they come to know what dna sequences they have taken who did they compare it with so the person him herself is dead rajiv gandhi is dead in that incident as well as the one who killed him how do you know who it is because it's very important for you to identify so and so Just to prove, because he is a VIP of the country, was an ex-prime minister of the of India, so they wanted to show, identify who it is who killed him. Maybe family members. 
correct family members who share some amount of dna with him so what they have done they collected the dna samples from the crime scene so muzzle tissues mostly because everything got splattered there right because of the bomb so they collected dna samples on rajiv gandhi's dead body and the one close to him they identified how many different people were there how many different dna samples were there and then they already had a clue that ltt was planning this so they collected dna samples of the people who were part of ltt and whose members were actually missing or they thought probably were part of this incident so they collected their samples and the sample was matched with their parents with her parents or close family members so they were the reference sample and the samples found at the crime scene so together with other evidences they came to a conclusion that so and so person killed rajiv gandhi so rajiv gandhi's assassination case was very famous and second case uh, if you want to make a note of it as 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 a case study this is called the tandoor case tandoor case it is known as so this case happened in uh, 1995 okay in 1995 so where uh, congress leader called sushil sharma from delhi sushil sharma he had a fight with uh, his wife naina so and uh, he killed in the process he killed her he shot her but he wanted to uh, hide the evidence so what he had done he took her and put her in a tandoor in a nearby restaurant in new delhi he put her body in the tandoor okay but uh, police got reported related to this that they they could uh, actually save in a way they didn't save the body but uh, some remainings of the body could be obtained after that some portions or parts of the body could be obtained so what they had done they collected what we have just talked about they collected dna samples from that they matched the dna sample the husband husband dna sample was found on the body body along with other uh, of course uh, in investigation process it, they came to a conclusion that it was him who killed her so i'm not sure at what point of time they have uh, collected dna samples for rajiv gandhi's assassination but there is that supposed to be the first case where dna evidence might have been used but if it was used later on the remaining tissues i'm not sure that could be a possibility okay but i remember one of my student once i was teaching snt class she happened to go to ccmb for a open day and she she told me that they displayed rajiv gandhi's dead body parts remaining parts so which were kept because ccmb at that time did the forensic analysis on that i don't know uh, some parts were kept or they be they were the you know uh, some sort of display pieces that they wanted to have i don't know what exactly they were but uh, they seem to show the, those parts but this happened in nine, early 1990s even before this 1991 i think so these are one of the initial cases i don't know exactly i could not verify whether this was the first case so don't highlight that but the few important cases are this rajiv gandhi's assassination case and uh, naina sani's case or tandoor's case this one like the dna evidence started becoming more and more popular in india since the beginning of 1990s later i think many cases they have used this i think recently not very very recently but our uh, dadri dadri lynching case dadri lynching case they could identify the animal as so and so and also um, salman khan's salman khan's case when he killed a black buck okay they could prove that uh, the one the animal that he killed was a black buck which is endangered animal and the punishment was decided based on the dna evidence so center for dna fingerprinting and diagnostics cdfd which is a dedicated organization for dna fingerprinting and analysis again in hyderabad which is uh, uh, founded by again uh, dr lalji singh okay so this is a hub and you sometimes hear in the news the dna fingerprint was analyzed at cdfd hyderabad okay this is the nodal organization for the dna fingerprinting analysis in india 
Okay, that is where the samples go and, and uh, analysis happens. Okay, first let me, so we can definitely use DNA fingerprinting for criminal investigations, matching suspects DNA in the crime scene as we have just talked about. Also, we can use it for solving paternity cases. DNA fingerprinting has a great use in solving paternity cases. Okay, we have this topic in the syllabus, paternity testing. How are paternity testings done? So in unit 12, paternity diagnosis. Unit 12, there is one topic called paternity diagnosis. You explain about as one. I'm going to tell you a few other possibilities there when I discuss about that in the class 12 for uh, unit 12. But for now, remember uh, that DNA fingerprinting is one of the greatest tools that can be used in uh, defining or identifying the biological parent, usually biological father. Okay, but how, how is that going to be different from what we just did? So DNA fingerprinting can be used in paternity dispute cases as an excellent evidence to prove or disprove the claim. If someone says that uh, so and so is biological father of her child, so DNA fingerprinting can be a good tool. And the well-known case in this field is, any idea? A VIP's case was solved like this. I don't recall his name. He was a governor in UPCM also. Exactly. He was a CM, UPCM and a governor of United Andhra Pradesh, N.D. Tiwari. So N.D. Tiwari and some uh, women actually claimed that N.D. Tiwari is the biological father of her son. So of course, VIPs, it may happen sometimes in the interest of name or fame or money. So what they have done, they performed DNA analysis. Indeed, that boy was found to be the uh, son of Indi Tiwari. I forgot his name. I think his name is uh, Rohit, if I'm not wrong. Rohit. He passed away a few years ago. I think they said his wife killed him. This was in the news. So he became the legal son of uh, Indi Tiwari. Okay, but his father passed away. Later he was killed. So in the paternity cases, this is what they normally do. So you have a uh, child I probably will take another simple example here. Okay. Baby. So this is a baby, mother and father. Father A or father B. Okay. Can you carefully observe this and tell me which of these people, father A or father B, is a biological father of this baby with this DNA pattern? Little complex pattern you see here. But uh, remember one clue here. So we babies usually share some amount of DNA with the mother, some amount of DNA with the father. Normally, 50%, 50% it says, but it doesn't have to be exactly 50%. So look for some fragments with the mother, matching with the mother from the baby's uh, DNA fragments and some from the, with the father. Father A. Father A. Father A. Okay. <laughs> Father B is also. Father B. Father B. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's go with few bands. Maybe uh, this band is with the mother, also similar band because it's far away, not present in the father. Eh? Okay, one band is missing in father eh, from the baby, but mother has it. So we can rule out. It doesn't have to be present in the father, eh? but B has it. So this doesn't prove anything. So second fragment from the baby. It more or less matches with the mother's DNA, father's DNA, father's DNA. So it doesn't, it is not enough to prove it. So one here, babies, the third fragment is not present in the mother, is present only in the father A, but not in the father B. So this is more towards father A's DNA match. Okay. Next one, present in the mother. So the one after that, present in the mother as well as the father won't help us. So it is fragment, which is at the eight, position eight here, is only present in father A, but this is missing in him. Finally, so these fragments, babies, these two are present here. So two fragments clearly are only matching with the father A. Remaining, there is an overlap. So definitely father A seems to be the, the more, um, uh, with the more matching with the DNA of the baby. So many fragments, this fragment here, this fragment here between mother and father got matched. This matched here, this matched here. So basically you can construct 
all the fragments in the baby with only mother and father a without the need for father b's dna do you see that there it's not matching one or two fragments it's a combination mix if you mix the mothers and fathers dna you will find all the fragments in the baby do you see that do you agree with me on that so father's a dna is the uh, father a is considered to be the biological father like that paternity cases can be with evidence like this can be solved and is a very very reliable they don't lie they are highly reliable and they don't change they don't change over the decades i was telling you over the centuries and millions of years also they stay all right okay like that paternity dispute cases can also be solved using this so paternity dispute if they ask about write briefly about role of dna fingerprinting we'll also going to talk about blood groups i think next topic i'm going to talk to you about the applications of blood groups there also we are going to learn about it. any other application so parentage criminal investigations we can maintain a database now indian government is working on a dna regulation bill dna regulation bill as part of the bill they are bringing they are planning to establish dna database centers in india national databases state wide databases dna regulatory board will be established so they are bringing guidelines to establish this in india okay so da database can be used for matching the suspects dna with the criminal database you watch this in uh, you like uh, hollywood movies right uh, a person's fingerprint or a face is identified they look in the database matching database so like that in future a database can be maintained where crimes can be solved faster with this database so fbi's database is called codis combined dna indian system fbi's database don't have to make a note of that so also uh, in diagnosis of hereditary disorders dna fingerprinting can be used in diagnosing genetic problems how is that possible we said dna fingerprinting highlights the uh, differences or variations how is it possible to use it as a diagnostic tool what is the key thing here can so you can you, you repeat sir Yes, the question is: I was telling you, are we are talking about DNA fingerprinting used in identifying the variation among people and establishing identity? How can this be used in diagnosing genetic problem, identifying genetic problem? Deletion, duplication. Okay, so what happens in deletion, duplication? How DNA fingerprinting is used there? That we can find that this gene is missing, so. That's the reason the person is suffering from so and so disease. Okay, but absence of that is not revealed by DNA fingerprint. You don't at know population what? at a population level. Maybe uh, looking at a person who has the genetic disease, and then okay. Okay. comparing it with rest of the maybe a sample size and see why disease burden or depth that we discussed. So it can be more specific than that. What they can do, they can create a probe matching with that mutated region, or as you are saying, deleted region, duplicated region. So let's say if a particular region, I think I was telling you, we kept using this example in breast cancer, BRCA1 gene, BRAC1 gene gets mutated, or hemophilia factor eight or factor nine gets mutated. So if you actually create a probe which matches to that region, if there is a mutation, that region won't bind. Or you create a probe that only binds to the mutate mutant version. Okay, you can create a probe to look for the mutant version. You can also look for the area which is not binding to it, but it won't be confirmatory. But it will suggest that the sequence may be absent. So you can create probes to match exactly the mutant region of that gene. But for that, prior knowledge is needed. You need to know that this is where mutation is taking place. This is how, in the genetic disease person, person suffering from genetic disease, will have this sequence. That information has to be known first. Then you create a probe and look for the presence of that. Like that, specific sequences can be identified with the mutation. Okay, disease diagnosis. That is why CDFD is called Center for Dis uh, Diagnostic Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics. It is called. So diagnostics is a very important application of DNA fingerprinting. So genetic diseases, specific uh, deletions, substitutions, or additions can be identified using DNA fingerprints, uh, specifically using probes. Excuse me. What else? Where else can we use it? 
dead bodies in natural disasters if many people died in an incident and they are not recognizable their family members are looking for them what can you do you can collect their dna match with the dead bodies dna if there is a match you know he so and so or she so and so so establishing the identity of dead bodies in natural disaster wars when wars happen Okay, accidents happen where mul you know, multiple people died. Okay, aeroplanes crashing into the water. Dead bodies after identified after months or after days. You know who were there on the plane. Collect their DNA, match the dead body with them, with the pair, with the families. Like that, identifying dead bodies, burned bodies. Sometimes you know, in accidents, dead bodies are probably burned. But if you have little bit of remnants of uh, bone cells or those things, also can carry. some amount of dna so you can use them as an evidence some small remainings have to be uh, required here okay right any anything like other otherwise it's not just applicable to or limited to humans pedigree studies of animals can also be done any anything else in anthropology in addition to what we talked about criminal investigation paternity identification databases the diagnostics of diseases identifying dead bodies even children got exchange in the um, you know hospitals i'm sure you have we might have watched these old movies right what happens in those movies if a baby is missing or got exchange in the hospital how do they identify each other they sing a song right and if child sings the same song or recognizes a song they identified but you know it's very impractical i don't think children will sing songs like that but we can use dna fingerprinting as an evidence to see if babies got exchange whose parents are them okay anything in anthropology specifically related to anthropology in addition to some of these archaeology fossils fossil studies okay identifying the or linking the uh, fossils with each other relationship how similar is the fossil that has identified to the existing humans or to the previously studied fossils of humans so evolutionary studies evolutionary studies in evolutionary studies and also in migration human migration so answering questions related to human origin human diaspora human migration so question like this like if Af people traveled from africa to europe first and then to india or africa to china india if you want to see the pattern dna similarities can be analyzed instead of looking for old dna sequences that is something that reveals more but you can look for certain regions where we have more differences if we have same sequence as chinese or same sequence is shared by africans you know some commonality between them like migratory pattern and as you migrate let's say you went to europe china india then europeans will be more similar to africans chinese will be next similar to africans and then indians so you will also know the order of movement of indians okay although it is sometimes is not very very evident but definitely dna fingerprinting can reveal this migratory pattern also nowadays they are using uh, y chromosome patterns male inheritance female inheritance that they are looking into now so human migratory pattern human evolution origins can be identified some examples like siberian origin of native american populations were identified using such type of experiments siberian origin of native americans okay so they identified the native american populations where they originated from and in the ecological anthropology we are going to study that adaptations human adaptations humans do adapt and in the process they may acquire some new mutations such new mutations can also be identified as part of the adaptation process using dna fingerprinting adaptation to different environments so as part of ecological anthropology this dna evidences are of use so disease susceptibility if some people are more prone to certain disease because of certain sequences create probes to those sequences look for their presence like for example 
Texas Biomedical Research Institute, US based organization and anthropological research there, they map the locations related to diabetes, people who, who get diabetes, how is this running in the families, cancers, obesity, osteoporosis, coronary heart problems. For some of the well-known diseases, they mapped the locations where some key differences are identified between normal people and the people having one of these diseases like sugar, cancer, obesity, etc. So in anthropological studies, anthropological geneticists, especially people from Texas Biomedical Research Institute, have identified those locations. Okay, and I use the word here quantitative trait loci, QTL we normally call quantitative trait loci or loci, however you say. So do you remember by any chance what quantitative trait? No, what is a quantitative trait or a measurable trait? It's been long ago, right, that we discussed Mendelian genetics. Height, pigmentation. Phenotype. Yes, go ahead. The trait related to phenotype, like which helped us to uh, like look over the phenotypes of the things. Which are the range? Hmm. Range. Quantitative traits are measurable. Height, measurable trait. Eye color, we have some techniques these days, we can measure them. Okay, measurable traits, skin pigmentation. So those are called quantitative traits. Polygenic, poly inheritance that we talked about, multifactor inheritance we talked about. Those traits are quantifiable. They're not discrete Mendelian characteristics. Like either you have a character, you don't have a character. Either you have a widow speak or no widow speak. It's not like that, right? So here we have range. So they're, quanti they're called quantitative traits. Like that quantitative trait loci are the regions where such genes are present. So they are mapped by anthropological geneticists at Texas. Okay, so here I mentioned, I added a little bit of idea here, extra idea on anthropological applications of DNA fingerprinting, human origin, human migration studies. Example, Native American population migration was identified using this type of techniques. And those changes that happen in people who are adapting to the new environment. Okay, and uh, disease relevance as per this example I've given you. Okay, right. So this is about DNA fingerprinting and DNA fingerprinting technique as uh, as, as principle of it, method, process of it, applications of it. So where is it relevant? I was telling you 9.4 disease diagnosis. So chromosomal abnormalities can be diagnosed using it. 9.4D has DNA profiling. So this is another name to DNA fingerprinting. And then uh, unit 12, we are going to talk more in the aspect of paternity diagnosis. Partly I'm going to cover as part of the next unit. And also otherwise, you know, paternity diagnosis can be done using DNA fingerprinting. Also, you can see it as a method in part of human genetics in disease diagnosis, etc. Okay, next we are going to move to 9.6, unit 9.6. First of all, if you see the syllabus of 9.6, this is this little bit technical unit. This is a bit technical unit. And uh, I'm telling you that usually we are not getting too many questions from this. There are only a few selected questions are coming from this. For the other topics, there is not much information and uh, technically it's a little complex. So I haven't seen many questions from it. Few areas. There are, I think, three topics which usually show up in the exam. I'm going to tell them as well as briefly, in case if they decide to give questions from these topics as well, which have not come before, I'm also going to give you a brief idea. This is a little bit more technical. So I worked on bringing information on this. You don't find much of this information other than PNAT and PNAT doesn't explain it well at all. Okay, so uh, I'm already telling you a bit technical, but I'm going to tell you the concept, give you enough examples for you to remember. Okay. So what is the syllabus? The title of this is called Age, Sex and Population Variation as Genetic Markers. So in short, you can call this unit as genetic marker unit, genetic markers. But they're talking about 
genetic marker varying with age with gender or with sex with population so how markers can be used in studying populations or finding what are the different applications of genetic markers examples are given what are the examples here we are going to learn in detail about abo blood groups we are going to learn about abo blood groups and also rh blood groups abo and rh blood groups we are going to learn here abo and rh blood groups we are going to learn here plus the specific types of markers which of which one of them we already discussed as part of briefly as part of immunogenetics which is hla marker human leukocyte antigen or mhc major histocompatibility complex that we talked about so this can be seen there so here we also have other markers like hp it is called haptoglobin transferrin gm gm also we briefly discussed in immunogenetics gm refers to the gamma globulin or antibodies that we talked about immunoglobulins we talked about one particular category of antibodies that we need to briefly know how they can be used in studies of populations blood enzymes few enzymes found in the blood they were very general here but i'll pick up one or two examples of enzymes which are well known as uh, genetic markers so few examples abo blood groups hla haptoglobin or hp transferrin gamma globulin or gm blood enzymes these are examples briefly i'll tell you how are they good markers with examples next physiological characteristics physiological changes this is where questions are coming abo blood groups are usually asked other hla hp transferrin gm blood enzymes i have not seen them hla can be asked as a short note that is possible otherwise none of these are asked physiological characteristics are asked like hemoglobin level how does hemoglobin vary in us with age and also with gender we have variation in hemoglobin we'll put little bit of light on to that and body fat variation how does body fat vary between children women men we are going to learn about those gender based and age based variations pulse rate similarly variation in pulse rate variation in respiration so heartbeat and pulse rate are same so pulse rate and heartbeat respiratory functions our breathing rate how does it vary with age and also sensory ability how do we see things how do we perceive things how do we hear things so there is one example that we are going to talk about the like color blindness in some populations how does it vary so sensory perceptions in different cultural and socio economic groups okay this is the idea so first part is bit technical second part is more analytical okay right so let me start discussing what are genetic markers i'll briefly talk to you about genetic markers what they are okay what are the genetic markers and we'll talk about abo blood groups right so first of all what are genetic markers did we use the term markers before i think uh, when i was talking to you briefly about snps single nucleotide polymorphism genetic polymorphism i use the term genetic markers by any chance you remember what is genetic marker if not can you guess what is marker yes we shall prox position on a chromosome it is a position of a approx position on a location on a chromosome approximate position of a gene on a chromosome or a sequence on a chromosome that we used in gene mapping right but what is a marker yes we talked about genetic markers or markers as part of it correct marker based mapping that we talked about but why is it called a marker what does it mean by a marker in literary sense in literary sense in general marking means what marker means what 
basically something that shows or identifies a location, a reference point. If I have to use a general word, a reference point. I think I was using this example in the Google Maps. Genetic mapping, Google Maps. What does Google Map show us? Google Map shows the location of particular addresses. They will tell you. They'll give you order of the places in a given area. So marker is a landmark in a way. Let's say every time if you, let's say you're asking for an institute, where is the institute is present? Our institute in Hyderabad is present opposite to Canara Bank in Hyderabad, let's say. Or so and so Punjab National Bank or a library, central library, let's say. So these are reference points. So genetic markers are those places. This is to develop the idea. Okay, I'm going to give points later. First, this is for you to think. I'm going to add points and give you a little bit of more information on this. But I want you to have an idea. So marker is a reference point which helps us to identify location, maybe disease causing gene or maybe something like that. That is called a genetic marker. So what is genetic marker? If you want to write down, it's a gene or a DNA sequence with a known location on the chromosome. So it's a gene or a DNA sequence with a known location. So its location is known and it is acting like a reference because like central library location is known. So and so bank is known in the given area that acts like a marker to us to identify something else. So the sequence is markers, location is known on the chromosome. Okay, its location is known on the chromosome. So this reference is may not be the part of actual DNA sequence, may not be part of the, may not be part of the gene making a protein. So the genetic marker itself may be part of a gene or may not be part of a gene. So it may not be doing any specific function. Let's say this institute is that you are giving reference to a bank. Bank has nothing to do with running an institute, right? But we are only lo locating it. Maybe let's say if you go to university, this uh, institute is next to library. So they both are connected. Sometimes it is part of the functional copy, functional component of it function, sometimes not. So marker may be part of the gene or may not be part of the gene. So marker itself may be part of a gene or may not be part of a gene and may not have a function, known function. It may be simply a reference point. So how are they useful to us? Genetic markers can be of great use in many ways. As I was telling you, they can act like reference points. So as a reference point, they can help link an inherited problem, a genetic disease. Okay, let's say a disease causing gene is present next to a so-and-so marker, so-and-so known marker. We used a restriction enzyme markers. So wherever you cut in the DNA, if it gets cut here, this fragment will contain a gene with a mutation in it. So the restriction site is maybe away from the actual gene, but when you cut with that restriction enzyme, this piece can be identified. So meaning restriction site is located close to the, the gene that underwent mutation for so-and-so disease. But you are, you are recognizing that gene with respect to the restriction site. So restriction site is here, that gene is here. So whenever you use, it is very close to the restriction site. When you make it cut with it, it is found within this region of the DNA fragment when separated on the size and electrophoresis. Like that, a genetic marker can help us identify a gene responsible for a genetic disease. So it will help us locate that. So to be more specific, if I have to explain it to you, so sometimes what do you notice? Cutting of the restriction enzyme. Let's say you cut a particular DNA sequence with known restriction enzyme. It made four fragments. The gene responsible for this problem may be present in the third fragment. You will know in the third fragment related to this restriction enzyme, this shows defective gene. So like that with reference to restriction site, this is where it is. So here, what is the marker? The actual gene is not the marker. The restriction site becomes the marker because it is helping us to reach the actual defective gene. 
So genetic markers in that sense can help us identify an inherited disease and the responsible gene for that. Okay, next in linkage mapping, in recombination mapping or linkage mapping, what did we learn? If DNA segments close to each other on a chromosome tend to be inherited together, if A and B is present close by, so both A and B tend to go together. Even recombination may not split it, may not separate it. So those segments that are closely placed to each other on the DNA, they tend to go together. They tend to go together. Okay. So what is the use of them going together? Can we rely on the reference point to tell? Like, I think I might have told you this. Uh, a person with the blue color eyes tends to have anemia, let's say, or a certain genetic problem. Is it possible if both genes responsible for eye color and the disease, then we can use as a reference point because they go together, they run in families together because they happen to be present close to each other. So recombination will not separate it. Okay, like that DNA segments that are close to each other on a chromosome, they tend to inherit together and they can give us clue about some gen genetic diseases while acting as a genetic mark. Okay, so like that genetic markers can help us to track the inheritance of a gene that is present close to this marker, although that gene is not known. Even if you don't know, you know that this gene goes together with the eye color, gene goes with the hair type. So that you can identify, the correlation can be seen. Okay, so this is a brief idea about what are genetic markers and what is the use of them. Okay, next we'll begin with the first example in the syllabus. Yeah, ABO blood groups. We are going to talk about ABO blood groups. We already discussed a little in little about the ABO blood groups, but I'm going to give a bit more detailed analysis or information on ABO blood groups. So I'll ask you a few questions. See if you can answer them. One for question number one, are the ABO blood groups are the only type of blood groups that we have in humans? Are there only ABO blood groups that are that are present in humans? No. What are the other blood groups you know of? H. H. Okay. What is H blood group or H refers to? What blood group is that? Bombay. Blood group. Bombay blood group. Okay. What else? So ABO blood groups, RH blood groups are major blood groups of humans. May, majority of us have ABO blood groups, but in few minor cases, we have other blood groups. So ABO and RH blood groups are major blood groups. There are several minor blood groups are present. There are several few hundreds of minor blood groups are there. So there are maybe hundreds of few hundreds of minor blood groups are there. Example, Bombay blood group, there's something called Duffy blood group, Kid, Kel, are some of the minor blood groups which we don't have to learn, but be familiar that there are also minor blood groups present. Okay, so major blood groups are ABO and RH. Minor blood groups are there like Bombay blood group, Duffy blood group can be taken as examples for the minor blood groups. Okay, so our focus here is ABO blood groups. So what defines blood group in a person? How or what qualifies to call a person as a A blood group person or a B blood group person? What makes a person to have A blood group or to be considered as a blood group person? No idea? 
if someone is of a blood group person why is he called an a blood group person what makes him to be a blood group person what is unique in him different from a b blood group person the antigens antigens correct antigen present on their blood so if this is a blood group okay they will have a antigens b blood group people will have b antigens and ab will have both of them a blood group person will have a antigen b will have b antigen so on the rbc of these people specific type of antigens will be there based on the antigen you call them a blood group or b blood group person okay so if you want you can draw the box like this so write down the group a b a b and o on top and on the left hand side you draw you write antigens antibodies antigens and antibodies okay only two columns are enough yeah so this is not needed so in this column what you can write so put a circle and write a and show antigen with a so you put a uh, spike like this okay with circle called a so a blood group person will have a antigen so on rbc is a a blood group people a antigens will be present similarly b blood group person will have what antigens b antigens so instead of showing this color or a mark write b here put a spike in the circle of that you put b spikes name spikes as b antigens here name spikes as a antigens so a antigen on rbc results in a blood group b antigen on rbc results in b blood group what about ab people as you see in the image here a b both a present a is present both b, b both a and b are present so two colors like this color and this color both can be seen so they have both a and b antigens two antigens are together a and b antigens are together what about in the person with o blood group so neither a nor b is present in them. they don't have a antigen or b antigen okay but they have some something else they have other antigen but normally in at this level we don't talk about the o group but when i compare to the bombay blood group i'm going to briefly tell you but for now a blood group people have a antigens b blood group people have b antigens ab has both ab antigens group o have no ab antigens they don't have ab antigens no a present no b present that is why it's o or zero zero for a and b no a antigen or no b antigen so antigens define their blood group in the second uh, row if you want to write write what antibodies are present in their blood what antibodies are present in their blood so do you know the answer to this a group person without looking into the table can you tell me a group people can they have antibodies for a no they cannot have antibodies for a what happens if they have antibodies for a a and the blood cells die basically those antibodies will destroy the antigen on the rbc they will destroy the rbc so if a person carries a antigen and antibodies for a there will be fight between both of them okay blood blood will be rbcs will be destroyed so a person can have b antibodies antibodies for b not for a person with blood group a has a antigen and antibodies for b okay if you understand this logic you cannot have same antibodies against your antigen 
So if you have A antigen, you cannot have A antibody or antibody against A, but you can have antibodies for B. So anti B can be present. Similarly, a person with group B, blood group B, can he have, uh, can he has a B, B blood group or antibodies for B? They cannot have antibodies for B. But what they can have? They can have antibodies for A. So B blood group person will have B antigen, but A antibodies or antibodies against A. What about a person with AB blood group? They have both A and B. Can they tolerate to have antibodies against A or antibodies against B? No, neither. Neither of those antibodies are present. So AB blood group people have no antibodies against, at least against no antibodies against A and B. But opposite is true with O. O has no antigens, but both the antibodies. O blood group people have no antigens, so they can tolerate to have antibodies against A and B. So opposite is true with O compared to group AB. Group AB, both antigens are present, but no antibodies. Group O, you know, no antigens are present, but both antibodies can be present. Okay, so this is a basic picture that you need to have with respect to the A, B, O blood groups. But we need to dig a little deeper into this. Okay, so that we can understand another blood group called Bombay blood group. Okay, briefly I'll explain you the difference here and also to understand a little bit about the compatibility because one major application of ABO blood groups in a given population is transfusion of blood. This is to check if someone's blood is compatible. Can I take, if I'm a B blood group person, can I have blood taken from A blood group person? Or I'm an AB blood group person, can I have blood taken from O blood group person? To have that compatibility, we need to know a little bit about this. This is a major application of AB blood groups. I'm sure you all probably know about this, right? What is a universal donor here out of these four? Don't without considering RH. We're only focusing on ABO at the moment. I'll add RH component. Oh. If oh, you blood can, group. Which oh, one? Blood o blood group is a universal uh, acceptor. You O blood group is a universal. Donor. Donor, donor. Universal donor. How do you know? What confuses students here? What do you need to remember? Because I know, I do understand that O and AB may confuse you. What do you need to know? So what antigens are present in O blood group? A and B. No. What antigens? No. No. Donor. O is a donor. O is a donor. AB is the receiver. So are you introducing any antigens from O to the AB person? If donor is group O blood group person and recipient is AB, are you donating any antigens? Are in the process, is a donor bringing any antigens? The blood is taken from the O blood group person, injected into the AB blood group person. You are not introducing any antigen from the group O blood. If no antigens are introduced, what do you make antibodies against? Can your body make antibodies against any of them? It cannot. So O blood group people can donate. This is true with A blood group person, B blood group person. O can give donate blood to either of these groups, A, B, A, B, with no problem because in, in any of these cases, you are not introducing antigens. So in that sense, you, uh, O can be universal donor. Of course, again, you have to worry about RH positive, RH negative. I'll explain that. But for now, to keep it simple, O is a universal donor in that case. Burned out, I have. In this, uh, we have antibody A and antibody B in O. Hmm. So if it donates to, let's say, B. Who so A B has antigen B. Hmm. Hmm. So it will attack, won't it attack antigen B because it has anti-A and anti-B both. Talking about donating A, B to A person, am I right? Or O? O to B and O to A, either of O to B or O to A. Okay. What are you saying? In A, let's say. In A, anti B is there. Hmm. So what do they attack? Anti B will attack what? Uh, seeing since O, there are both anti A and anti B, won't uh, giving O to A or B attack the antigen? Very good. Yes. Some reactivity, some cross reactivity will be there. But it won't be much so, because. Um, is that your if yes, Sunil, go ahead. I am saying the antibodies of O since it has anti A and anti B both. So yes. if if we give to N, group A or group B, it has antigen A and antigen B. Yes. So won't it attack the uh, part which is against going? But basically, yes. if someone takes the O blood group, 
okay blood antibodies present in the observed group person won't they attack the group a and group b people hmm. right? i think vishal was asking the same thing uh, it can but the thing is uh, there are two different scenarios so one scenario you are carrying some amount of antibodies ready made few antibodies are there in the observed group okay few antibodies they are accidentally formed in them usually they say that we are exposed to some microorganisms towards which we make this antibody so they are not much small amount of antibodies can be taken here which may kill some a antibody uh, antigens or some b antigens but only to limited extent the problem comes only when your body keep producing antibodies against it so what is important from the donor always antigens are important so you don't focus on the antibodies in the donor because only few small amounts of antibodies are taken in the process so they don't cause too much of visible effect this is normally seen when children are born to the mother with a different blood group that can be seen babies develop jaundice that is because of this incompatibility small amount of uh, problem can happen but it will go away some uh, uh, blood blood cells are destroyed but they will be gone you will have enough blood cells to replace it so that won't be a problem but it can cause a problem to some extent but it is ignored or we can ignore that negligible okay but the problem is more severe when you are introducing let's say a blood group is given to o blood group person opposite to this a blood group uh, blood is given to o blood group person. then you are introducing anti a antigens which will be throughout every rbc will contain antigens but antibodies that we are talking about in o are only small present in the blood little bit of little bit in the blood here you are introducing antigen so all rbcs carry antigens immune response immune system of the o blood group person will attack it it's not just the anti a antibodies that will attack it it is also our immune system which can make new antibodies against a so we can keep producing antibodies until we destroy the entire uh, newly introduced antigen that will be severe so always that is why we have to keep in mind donors antigens recipients antibodies okay your question is very valid okay so what about rh factor i'm not going to details about rh factor but just mention it so that it, this information becomes more correct like we cannot call simply o blood group as the universal donor we also have third antigen not only a antigen not only b antigen we also have what is called rhesus factor third antigen rhesus factor sometimes or more commonly we refer it to as d antigen d antigen we refer it to as or rhesus factor r h e s q s i'll tell you about rhesus factor story little later but for now so rhesus factor either some people have it or they don't have it if someone have a rhesus factor they are positive for it if someone don't have rhesus factor they are negative to it understand this statement i'll ask you few questions on this see if you can answer them okay so if the rhesus factor is present it is positive rhesus factor absent it is negative let's say a person has a blood group so a antigen and rhesus factor what is a blood group a person on his rbc has a positive a and rh factor a positive a positive okay let's see sunil so person has b b blood group okay person has a b antigen on rbc and no rh factor b negative b negative okay very good shweta so a person has a b antigens a antigen b antigen rh factor a b positive a b positive okay so who else we have uh, yash you are here so can i ask you this question like if a person has a b antigen but no rh factor what is the blood group ab negative ab very good so okay uh, preeti um, we have no antigens at all no o, o a no b no rh factor o negative very good o negative good right i think you got the idea clearly right so now tell me who is the universal donor preeti you tell me who is the universal donor Now, anyone else? By considering Rh factor, what is a universal donor? 
you said o, o positive o negative o, o positive o positive being rh being the dominant okay vishal uh, let's say that if someone if you are saying o positive is the universal donor if someone donates o positive universal donor means they can donate blood to others correct with other blood groups let's say o positive person donates blood to a positive person oh, sorry o positive you said right you o positive person donates blood to a negative blood group is it acceptable no no why because this person don't have rh anti uh, rh antigen so his body makes rh antibodies can make rh antibodies so if you are donating plus rh factor his body will react to it so all three negatives all three negatives negative for a negative for b negative for rh factor that is o negative blood group is a universal donor all three negatives no a no b no rh i know is universal acceptor then who can take the blood doesn't matter who's our blood it is out of this ab of blood groups ab group ab ab negative or ab positive ab positive ab positive is that positive. right Say apply the same concept, but other way around. I told you O has to have no antigens being introduced. If you are taking universal donor's blood, no antigen should be introduced. Neither A, B, or R H, and A B should be on the opposite side, on the other end. They should have all the antigens. So you're right, A B positive. They should have A. They should have B. They should have R H factor. So their body will not recognize neither A B or R H factor as foreign. so they won't make antibodies against them so ab positive is universal acceptor o negative is universal donor so remember all three negative all three positives all three negatives for donor all three positives for the acceptor okay so briefly i want to show you an image and end the class here in reality yeah i'll let you finish writing it but scientists have found out that although we tend to consider o blood group as universal but in one small population or small group of people in mumbai they found out that even o is not acceptable to them they even show uh, uh, the show they showed no compatibility against o they had a cross reactivity they take o even their body didn't accept it such a blood group is called bombay blood group because it was originally found in bombay especially in parsis of bombay It is called Bombay blood group. These people seem to have, are these people's bodies recognizing even O being a foreign part? But we so far talked about. I think I was careful enough to tell you that O didn't have A B antigens, but O has what is called H antigen. O has what is called H antigen. If you see on this side, left hand side, O has this H antigen. Do you see the difference between O blood group person, A B blood group, as a Bombay blood group person? Look at these these uh, circles that you see here, or these hexagonal structures you are seeing. They're sugars, because normally these antigens are glycoproteins. To the protein, glucose sugar molecules are attached. So what do you see here? H antigen. People with O blood group they have H antigen, capital H. You see here. So they have these four hexagonal structures. In in Bombay blood group, they are missing this red one. they only have this part in bombay blood group this small part is missing that can be identified as foreign so when o blood group blood is given to this people bombay blood group people their body can recognize this as another antigen and react to it make antibodies against it so bombay blood group people cannot even accept o blood group they require bombay blood group so population requirements we are able to study the understanding of population requirements based on the blood that is a very con common transfusion uh, component so if it is not acceptable it will be problematic that is what we are noticing here okay so uh, bombay blood groups lack h antigen sir is that what we have right exactly yes and you see in the image here so in o we wrote capital h in bombay we wrote small h So, O blood group we have extra moiety here. 
which is missing in the bombay blood group people so o blood group people have h antigen bombay blood group people don't have h antigen which is present in o blood group. so all whatever we talked talked about so far is true even textbooks only talk to this level but if you have to introduce the concept of bombay blood group then i have to tell more about o blood group where h antigen is present where this is missing in the bombay blood group okay also just have a look at it don't have to write or draw anything yeah so you don't have to draw these diagrams okay this makes it easy for you to understand that's why i've show you showed you o blood group has h antigen bombay blood group is missing h antigen that is a major difference do you see what about a and b what do you see in a and b how they are different from o blood group so o has a structure right in addition to the structure a has an additional component do you see it here similarly compared to o and b b has the same structure as o plus addition to that one more extra moiety of sugar so the antigen present between uh, compared to o and a is different and o and b is different this new and this piece is called a antigen this piece is called b antigen and whatever is missing from o with this small part is called as bombay blood group or small h antigen so it is not compatible o is although more or less universal donor some exceptions are there bombay blood group is an exception to that. okay right i'm going to stop the class here but in the in further uh, i'm going to talk to you briefly about in the next class i'm going to tell you the importance of abl blood groups why are they good markers i have seen this question in the exam before so that i'm going to explain you we we understood the concept of abl blood groups here in the next class i'm going to give you population analysis of blood groups worldwide abo blood groups how are they distributed in india how are abo blood groups are distributed and some key observations that we make with with respect to the abo blood groups where they can be good markers in studying some populations so anthropological relevance of blood groups we are going to talk about there so uh, short note had come in this before rh blood group had come and uh, once i think question was asked on the discuss the role of abo blood group system in resolving cases of disputed paternity i'm also going to explain you how blood groups can help us to some extent in solving paternity problems and what else uh, yeah what are the genetic markers and what is their usefulness one one question had come on genetic markers and their usefulness and why are blood groups considered as good genetic markers explain with examples so you have to explain what are we are talking about if this question repeats we have to explain what are genetic markers and what is their use and why with reasons explain why blood groups are good genetic markers so what features of abl blood groups make them good genetic markers okay so we should be able to answer this question after our discussion on uh, the first part of the discussion on the next class okay right this is it i'm going to stop any questions guys any questions on what we discussed today sir o negative can also take from anyone o negative can be taken from for anyone Blood, uh, o negative. Can it take from anyone? O negative people, no. They cannot take. Say, like, let's say anyone in the sense A blood group has. If O negative people take A negative blood, what happens? You are introducing A antigen into them. Always remember, donor shouldn't have any antigens, any new antigens. That is why O neg O negative is the good donor. They can only donate. They cannot take anybody's blood. Why? Their body won't accept it. Because if you take a a person's blood, you are introducing a antigen into O, and O never see a O person, O blood group person never saw any antigens, so, uh, a antigen. So his body will make antibodies against A. Same with B person, A B person. So A B plus, which have all the possible antigens out of this A B O system, they can sustain to take any any person's blood from A B O blood group system. O is on the other end. O cannot take because O has no antigens. His body never saw any antigens. Related to this, so their body has can make antibodies against. That means it only needs O negative only. Other than that, it doesn't. It exactly. only needs O negative. Okay. I think in reality, it may confuse some students. In reality, we have little bit of reserve, like uh, relaxation here. Like O positive sometimes is also considered as universal donor, although it is not. But think about it. Any person with A plus B plus A B plus can take O plus blood. Correct. so o plus is actually is more common than o negative you will see that in analysis in india majority of the people have rh factor positive so you rarely find o negative blood group so what happens 
there won't be enough people universal donor so o plus can be taken for a plus b plus and ab plus so in reality o plus can be used for all rh factor positives and o negative is good for all of them but which is rare so we rely on o positive for them but if is a negative person b negative prefer a negative b negative if not o negative okay good okay no more questions uh, sir yes so when we would be discussing the test papers so monday i'm going to discuss the papers on monday so i will send you the answer scripts tomorrow to you okay go through them so monday i'm going to briefly uh, maybe first part or last part will do i think first i'll teach the class towards the end of the class uh, i'll quickly go through the question and answers and then uh, i'll explain what shortcomings are there in general specifics will be given to you so instead of discussing specific ones common mistakes i will discuss in the monday's class okay so the papers will be given to you by tomorrow night so i will look at them before our session on monday morning monday sorry monday evening okay good so no class tomorrow so we'll again meet on monday we'll discuss the answer scripts uh, okay so before that uh, i don't know if you want to take test before that people have not taken the test please uh, if you have time or if you can prepare for that content do it or even afterwards also it's all right okay good right guys then so have a good night to you so we'll meet again on monday thank you sir